Hi, everyone from the Peace in Our Cities uh, campaign and network. Hi, this is Julia Roig uh, from Partners Global. And I got to meet a lot of you when we were together in Jordan last year, back when we could all still travel. And, and I was really pleased to be invited to speak on a topic um, that is actually near and dear to my heart, which is what are the creative ways that peace builders can raise money and sustain their work financially, especially to reduce violence uh, in urban areas. If you aren't familiar with the Partners Network, uh, Partners Global, even though we're based here in DC, we work um, through a global network of 22 affiliate organizations that are completely locally um, owned, locally led non-for-profits in their own context. And together over the years, um, we have really invested in teasing out different business models to sustain uh, their work um, in countries in radically different contexts from Yemen to Nigeria to Colombia to Albania. And uh, so we've spent a lot of time thinking about uh, diversified revenue and uh, what, what it really takes uh, to sustain our work in creative ways outside of just a very traditional donor model of writing a proposal, getting a grant, and then being paid to do a project. Um, and so there's three fundamental um, kind of concepts that I would start with that I'd wanna share with you that we talk about a lot in our trainings um, on this topic. Because I don't think you can just jump into the strategies of how to finance your work if your organization isn't really committed to a couple of principles. One is that we have to have an entrepreneurial mindset in our sector. This concept of being entrepreneurial to try new things, to innovate, uh, to fail sometimes, I think that um, we more and more need to incorporate an entrepreneurial mindset in the way that we think about how to finance our work which means we've got to kind of test some new things out, different activities, um, and, and be willing to uh, try things that may work, may not work, and that whole concept of failing fast. Um, sometimes we don't have the luxury within our sector, but we need to kind of build up, I think, that entrepreneurial muscle. The second concept that I wanted to share with you that we're really committed to at Partners, it's embedded in our name, is... Uh, is fundraising and revenue diversification through a partnership model. We don't necessarily need to just raise money for our own organizations to sustain our own programs. We've seen a lot of success in um, our network when we choose to work with other um, organizations. And so I would encourage you as you're thinking about these creative ways of funding your work, um, that you actually think who you work with. So um, potentially, you know, is there an, a theater group um, that you could work with, that you innovate around new activities, around kind of arts for peace? Is there an organization um, that already organizes a big festival every year um, that you could partner with them and, and be a part of the kind of violence reduction section of their festival? Um, you know, it's it's those kinds of ways of, of building on each other's assets, because then that's the third principle that I wanted to share, which is how important it is to have an understanding of the organization's assets. So, you know, what what do you have within your programs um, that that you can build upon um, and not necessarily just to get additional donor funding. Do you own your office space? Um, do you have staff that have particular training expertise? Because then um, in order to be able to really think about uh, diversifying your revenue, you have to then think about, well, okay, what's the, po the uh, profitability, let's say, um, uh, opportunity that I have to use these assets in a different way. Um, and then really um, compare that to the impact um, that you would have if you were to kind of align those assets in a new way. And so there, there's an organization called Spectrum 
that has a really easy to use matrix to plot um, the profitability and the impact of an organization's activities so that when you start to go down this route of thinking about new ways of financing your work, you're not gonna um, go down a route that actually may um, have you kind of lose money at the end of the day. And, and I actually see this quite often. So for example, um, maybe an organization decides that they wanna start uh, selling a training program and that's gonna build up uh, their unrestricted uh, reserve accounts to then be able to reinvest in the programs that they want, but they don't cost it out the right way. They don't think about the time the staff needs um, to spend developing the training program, the marketing costs and the outreach. And so then when you finally get 20 people to pay for a training program and you only charge them X amount uh, for that training program, then at the end of the day, you ended up uh, losing money. Um, now that's not to say you shouldn't try and then quickly, um, let's say, iterate uh, to potentially see, could you charge more money now that you have um, that training program in your pocket? Could you quickly expand upon it? And so those are the kinds of things, but having a really good handle on the financial kind of assets and then just the implications, the value proposition that you have as an organization. And so to speak a little bit more then about, um, you know, what are some specific strategies um, that we've seen work. So I did mention just um, revenue generation activities. This is really hard in our sector um, because it takes a lot of investment and then it depends on who you're selling those services to. But I will say that in the partners network, we have a lot of success um, in, in um, selling services and you know, maybe it's about 30% of the budget in the end. It never really kind of raises to about 50%, but that's 30% of the budget that we're not dependent on donors. And so what do I mean by revenue generation? Um, and, you know, it really is going to depend on the tax laws in a lot of your countries, whether you're allowed to make profit and how much profit you can make and still um, have your nonprofit status. But, you know, some of our network members, um, our actually offer mediation services, for example. And so they'll mediate family disputes, um, even some commercial disputes. And uh, those uh, fee, those fees that they get um, from selling their mediation actually kind of pays at least their administrative rent costs, which allows them to implement their programs for less, um, lots of uh, training, but a lot of folks also work directly with local governments. And I did want to mention this, and I know that this is problematic. In some countries, um, our network members will say, you know, we will not take money directly from the government because it doesn't allow us to then be critical on some of the public policies that we'd like to be advocating for. And in others, there's, there's really good um, public programs around violence prevention, training community mediators, working with uh, youth at risk, and so a client actually does become the government, the, the local government itself. Although the one thing that, um, you know, I think a lot of peace builders have had more reticence um, to work with uh, corporate partners in our programs. And uh, we also, you know, obviously it has, it's a sensitive issue depending on which context you're in and what level of business um, that you would want to be working with, for example, we work a lot with rotary clubs around the world, um, both in Mexico and in Colombia. Um, they invested in a positive peace program um, that allowed us to work with uh, young people and, and help to um, implement projects directly with youth peace builders um, in urban areas in some very difficult contexts. And you know, rotary is, is largely made up of, of small and medium business um, owners. But larger uh, businesses also are really interested in potentially sponsoring activities that we do. So as I mentioned, is there a festival? Um, is there a youth soccer league, something like this, that you could actually have a brand pay money to be a part of that program? Um, these are all creative ways of thinking differently about how you're bringing money in. You know, we barter with the networks to say maybe another 
organization has a really good kind of graphic design capability that can help so that you're not actually paying for that kind of service. Um, crowdfunding um, opportunities, depending on the country that you're in, so that um, community-based kind of giving small amounts, um, but potentially, you know, going directly to your community members and really demonstrating the value of the work that you're doing to reduce violence and, and asking for small donations. And then some of our colleagues actually do have membership programs um, so that uh, you may be a friend of, you know, your program, a specific program, and you really have to gather results. You have to have a value proposition in order to um, be able to communicate to your volunteers, to your members, to the people that are supporting you, to the potential sponsors, so that they believe in your mission and they want to be a part of reducing violence um, with you. So good luck on your journey. I know this work is not easy. We have a lot of resources on the Partners Global website about revenue diversification, about um, entrepreneurial mindset. I'm really happy to share with any of you, and I look forward to staying in touch. Good luck. Bye-bye.